ladies and gentlemen. First of all, can I just thank the association <coughs> for that uh, wonderful honor that you just bestowed upon me. Um, I'm very, very grateful to be associated with you. You do an amazing job, and I hope that uh, through what I'm going to talk about this evening, you'll all be able to go and leave the room with your heads held very high indeed, because the Association of Voluntary Guides is an extraordinary organization in this extraordinary city. York is a world-class city. We have a world-class university. We have world-class artists who have come from or who have made York their home. I mean, examples such as you know, John Barry, Dame Judy Dench, W.H. Orton, the great Austin Wright, and Francis Jackson, to name but a few. And we have a world-class heritage. And what better place to talk about the heritage of the city of York than this amazing building that we sat in now. It's just an extraordinary honor to be able to, to be here in this space and to be able to stand up here and, uh, and bore the lot of you for the rest of the evening. <laughs> so we have this world-class heritage. Um, we have unrivaled archives civic archives, ecclesiastical archives, private archives, the archives of the merchant adventurers held in this very building um, go back you know, into the 14th century. It's an extraordinary body of material. We have outstanding, almost unique in many ways, archaeological deposits. These deep, wet, anoxic, there's no oxygen in them, they exclude those bacteria that eat away the organic deposits. So we have these wonderful, you know, Viking shoes, Roman shoes. We have silk from China that's been made into, uh, into clothing in this very city in the 10th century. And of course, we have the largest Viking turd that's been excavated <laughs> anywhere in the world. We have an incredible range of buildings. You know, we have Roman towers and walls. We have this incredible array of medieval buildings, domestic buildings. We have the oldest terraced housing in the country here in Lady Row in Goodrum Gate. The churches of the city, the guild halls of the city. The medieval buildings in this city are second to none. And of course, we have fantastic later buildings, Georgian and, of course, 20th century buildings. The extension to the Theatre Royal being one of the unsung wonders of this city. And we have woven in throughout this these examples of human creative genius. Um, we have the magnificent Coppergate helmet, the York helmet probably made in this very city by craftsmen commissioned by a gentleman called us here. We have the example to leap on five, six hundred, well actually more than that, eight hundred years. We have the incredible Great East Window, John Thornton's incredible achievement in that early 15th century. These are truly examples of human creative genius. So why have I selected these? Because, of course, they are the criteria that UNESCO use when they're judging whether a place should be a World Heritage Site. York should be a World Heritage Site. Thank you. That work continues. However, I don't want to talk about the global importance of the heritage of this city. Actually, rather the opposite. What I want to do is talk about the local, the way in which the people of this place have engaged with the heritage of this city. 
And I also want to talk about the personal. I want to weave in how the heritage of this city has intersected with my own life at various points in time. And I also want to sort of highlight how important it is for everyone, for everyone to have the chance to take part in uncovering, conserving, managing, and enjoying the heritage of the place where they live. So, let's go back to 1947. We've been back to the 50s already. Um, but uh, 1947, Herbert Morrison announces the uh, proposed Festival of Britain in 1951. And from the outset, York is determined to be part of that festival. It's determined to play a key role. And sure enough, in 1948, it's agreed that York will be one of the provincial cities that organises, puts on a series of events to be part of the Festival of Britain. So in 1951, we have the Festival of Britain. And uh, I have here a tie <laughs> that my dad bought in 1951 when he went down to London, aged 18, to visit the, uh, the exhibitions on the South Bank. I was going to wear it see, but it's actually a little bit dirty. Um, and also, I didn't want to get salmon down the front of it. Um, so, he bought this tie in London and passed it on to me. And this, this is an important element that is woven throughout all of our lives. These objects being handed down through families. And it's probable that us here handed that helmet down to his son. And that his son might have given it to his son before 150 years after it was first made, it found its way into a pit in a Viking backyard in Coppergate. Well, I hope this time doesn't find its way into the 21st century equivalent of that Viking pit. <laughs> Heirlooms, memory are important elements of how we associate ourselves with place. So, the York Festival. Um, from the outset, heritage was at the heart of how York engaged with this Festival of Britain. But as will become apparent, I hope, through what I'm going to say this evening, actually, it wasn't it wasn't a, a, a process of looking back, but rather it was a process of taking the past and looking forward. So we have the revival of the mystery plays in St. Mary's Abbey Rooms. We have the restoration of the assembly rooms. Um, we have performances. So uh, Sir John Barbaroli and Adrian Bolt give concerts in the Rialto in Fishergate, now the Mecca Bingo Hall, um, where the Beatles were to play many years later. Lots of events, costume balls, the production of 1066 and all that at the Theatre Royal, flower show, brass bands, and of course a display of locomotives in the old railway station, which is now of course West Offices, the Council Offices. And I'm sure there's quite a few old puffers working <laughs> there today. I was one of them. <laughs> Mr. Tempest escaped too soon. <laughs> but what York also did at the Festival of Britain was it commissioned new architecture. So it commissioned two blocks of flats. One was constructed in Castlegate next to at uh, St. Mary's Church. The second was constructed in Paragon Street, the Festival Flats. And they're still there today, well, both sets of flats are still there today. But the Paragon Street Flats, to me, seem to be a wonderful example of the optimism and the architecture of the 1950s. And an example of how, at that time, York was already looking forward and say, we have this amazing past, but actually we're, we're engaging with the present, and we're moving forward, 
and we're going to build, as the Evening Press said in 1949, a block of modern flats, outstanding in design, yet suitable for the ordinary man in the street. The builder said the flats would be the modern architectural highlight of the festival. And uh, I, for one, think those flats are fantastic. And we can argue about that afterwards. But they are an amazing example of that architectural optimism of the time. However, what else came out of the Festival of Britain, or the Festival of York? Well, it's, it's you. It's as Barry has already talked about. It's the Association of Voluntary Guides, formed in 1951 as part of the city's contribution to the, to the Festival of Britain. You were there at the very beginning. And as Barry has said, you know, the corporation, it was actually the corporation's librarian, as I think as you said yourself, came up with the idea of using knowledgeable citizens. And, you know, I couldn't wish to see more knowledgeable citizens of York in one room than we have at the moment. You, know, you guys and girls in here know more about York than, uh, well, than many, many other people. The idea was, you know, to bring knowledgeable citizens together to show both the people of York and visitors to York around the city, to tell the stories of this wonderful place. The idea was supported by the council, and as Barry said, public meeting was called to promote the idea, a group was formed, and you were off, out of the blocks. And you've been at it for 70 years. Now what's interesting about the ABG, the Art Association of Voluntary Guides, is actually you fit into a long pattern of citizen engagement with York's heritage. So next year, the Yorkshire Philosophical Society celebrates its 200th anniversary. And they've been at the heart of telling stories about York for 200 years. The Yorkshire Architectural and York Archaeological Society was founded to promote the study of ecclesiastical architecture, antiquities, and design, the restoration of mutilated remains. Mutilated remains, isn't that a wonderful phrase? <laughs> and of churches which may have been desecrated within the county of York. They held their first meeting on 7th of October, 1842, 20 years after the YPS. And they too, actively engaged in telling stories about this city. It was 60 years later when they, they added archaeology to their title and became the, the Yorkshire Architectural and York Archaeological Society. And of course we have the Civic Trust, the Georgian Society, and many more voluntary groups, amenity societies, all of whom are an active citizenship engaged with telling stories about the past of this amazing city. There's one individual I'd like to sort of highlight here as well, and that's Peter Wenham. I'm sure there are those of you in the room here who knew Peter Wenham. I only met him fleetingly once. Peter was archaeology in York before York Archaeological Trust was established. And he worked with a group of people, the York Excavation Group, a group of people who went out and excavated sites with Peter, worked with him, did the archaeology, a keen group of volunteers who worked with him on his incredible program of excavations in the city. And they went on after Peter retired and continued to work to Coppergate with York Archaeological Trust. Peter, as I said, before YAT was set up, he was, he was the virtual personification of archaeology in York, and Roman York in particular. And um, I only wish, and some of you might have been there actually, so I, I, I'd love to know, 
but I only wish I had been there in 1971 to see the procession that was held to mark the 1900 years of York's recorded history, where Peter walked through the city, portraying the Emperor Septimius Severus himself. Can you imagine it? Quite a sight, I'm sure. And in 1972, we have the establishment of the York Archaeological Trust. And York Archaeological Trust continued this um, pattern that had been set of working with volunteers, of getting volunteers to work on archaeological sites, giving people the opportunity to have that hands-on experience of working with archaeology in the city. And hundreds of volunteers worked on the Coppergate site. And YAT, of course, went on to change the face of how the past is presented to the general public, first with Jorvik and then with the Archaeological Resource Centre. So in your, we have this, this, this wonderful pattern, tradition, of people being engaged with the past in this city. And in the 1970s, there was still this dynamic relationship between those who were paid to do archaeology, and at that time, those individuals were mainly academics, they were people based in museums, or the people who worked for the Ministry of Public Buildings and Works, the Department of the Environment, as it became. There was a dynamic relationship between those people and the general public, and, and I was one of the beneficiaries of that. So, in 1973, I was sat in Darlington thinking about you know, how I was going, what I was going to be, where I was going to go. And I read in the Northern Echo an article that said Durham University are excavating the Roman site at Pierce Bridge. So I thought, that sounds good. So I sort of said to me, I said, this sounds interesting. I said, well, why don't you go out? Why don't you go out there? and see, see what's going on. So I got on the bus one Monday morning, and I went out to Pierce Bridge, got off the bus, rather sheepishly walked onto the site, and sort of made my way to the, to the site hut where a few people were having a cup of tea, and said, you know, can I, do you think I might be able to, 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 to take part in this? And I said, oh, I have to have a word with the, I have to have a word with the director. So I went over to see the director, Dr. Scott, and I said, would you be able, could, could I come and join in? Of course, of course, yes, of course you can take part. Oh, I said, okay, well, when, when, when can I start? Now. <laughs> oh, so I was then parachuted into a ditch, a Roman ditch, with a trowel, and said, and, 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 and somebody who knew more about it than I did, and I was able to start excavating then. And, uh, on and off, I've continued excavating and being an archaeologist ever since. What's interesting about that, of course, is that it's almost impossible to do that today. You can't walk up to an archaeological site that's happening in York. A teenager, a young person, can't go and knock on that site door and say, can I join you, please? It just doesn't work that way anymore. However, in the 80s, I think YAT, to its great credit, continued that tradition of working with volunteers, as did many museum-based archaeologists around the country. However, you know, the pace of redevelopment that was taking place in the country, in the cities and towns, that introduced this imperative to record, to rescue, these, this archaeology before it was destroyed. And this imperative, this, this demand to record archaeology was actually to disrupt this fruitful relationship between professionals and amateurs. And as part of the response to this threat, archaeology went through an important process in the 80s and 90s, which was professionalization. And you know, this unfortunately witnessed a separation, a schism almost, between 
this emerging professional class of archaeologists and the amateur. Interestingly, it's at the same time that metal detecting begins to grow in popularity. <coughs> also, it's driven by the fact that you, know, you get technological improvements in the equipment that's available. But I just want to read something from the, uh, the National Council for Metal Detecting's website. It's really interesting insight. <coughs> Excuse me. Perhaps, on the other hand, those visits to museums ignited some spark of interest in our past, but left you feeling somewhat frustrated. You felt an overwhelming desire to touch the artifacts and coins that were once the everyday items of use by our ancestors. But those glass barriers denied you the privilege of making that physical contact with the past. Again, you certainly weren't alone. Until about three decades ago, that privilege was reserved for the lucky few such as archaeologists, museum staff, historians, and scholars. Archaeologists, of course, would normally have been the first to touch any object that came out of the ground after having been lost or deliberately hidden for hundreds, if not thousands of years. These finds would then have been forwarded to museums, which had the task of cleaning and conserving the artifacts, prior to them being studied by experts and scholars, only then would a select few of these tre treasures be put on display for the public to admire. So metal detectorists there are pointing out you know, that the public is being separated from the objects. They're being taken out of that equation of being involved in this process of discovering and engaging with the past. Now, I would argue that professionalization in archaeology was a necessary process. Archaeology and archaeologists had to be placed alongside the other professions engaged in development. Architects, engineers, surveyors, and planners. They have the RIBA, they have the RICE, the RICS, and the RTPI, to name but four of the of the royal institutes that exist for those professions. <clears throat> Archaeology had to move into that field. However, this move towards professionalization did not mean that archaeology was safe. And at some point, someone is going to have to sit down and write the history of 1988-89, the year of three great archaeological disasters. In London, the Hugging Hill Baths and the Rose Theatre. And here in York, you have the Queen's Hotel. Now, these three sites all shared sort of one narrative, which was that you had the destruction of archaeological deposits coming about through planning consent being granted without any thought given to the impact that planning consent would have on the archaeological deposits of the site. Now that year of three disasters had a number of outcomes, one of which I'm pleased to say was that I got a job here in York as <laughs> principal archaeologist. So in October 1989, the council, having had its fingers thoroughly burned by the Queen's Hotel disaster, determined that that would never happen again, and also determined that it wanted to continue its process of economic development and moving forward in the city. They, with help from English Heritage, created the post of archaeologist, principal archaeologist, and I, unbelievably, was appointed to the post. In true York fashion, of course, you have to realise that the title of the post, Principal Archaeologist, 
cleverly disguised the fact that I was the only Archimedes. <laughs> So it actually took government action to make the future of archaeological deposits more secure. And they published in November 1990 a wonderful document, which I'm sure you've all got by your bedsides, and I'm sure you've all read, um, Planning Policy Guidance Note 16, Archaeology and Development. A right riveting read, I have to say. <laughs> Characterization leaves a bit to be desired, the plot's a bit thin, but in policy terms, it was a game changer. It established archaeology within the planning system. Archaeology is finite. You know, we're not making Roman deposits anymore. Every time you take a bit away, you're reducing the amount of archaeology that is there. It's precious. You shouldn't be destroying it without good cause. The most important deposits should be preserved, they should be left in the ground. And the public value of those deposits should be realized. If you're going to dig them up, you've got to share what you do. You can't just keep it amongst archeologists. So how did I set about tackling this in York? within the council. And in fact, how did we all in the city tackle this gap that had developed between professionals and non-professionals? Well, the policy in York was a simple one. Let's leave as much archaeology in the ground as possible. Let's squirrel it away for future generations to engage with. Um, interestingly, some archaeologists viewed this as being, and, and in fact, one very famous archaeologist Professor Martin Biddle publicly called the York policy anti-intellectual. That we were that we were actually saying, no, we're going to stop you doing work here. We're not going to do any archaeological research. Whereas actually the truth was the opposite. If you're a librarian, if you're an archivist, what do you do? You look after the material that you've got. And then when people want to research you, you let them take a book out. You let them take a document out. What you don't let them do, of course, is cut little words out, take photographs of part of it, make little notes and drawings of it, and then destroy the documents and the book. That's what archaeologists do. We destroy deposits. Archaeology is controlled destruction. So in York, alongside saying we're going to preserve as much archaeology as possible. We also put in place programs of evaluation. Let's find out what these deposits are on the sites where we're preserving those deposits. Let's pursue opportunities for archaeological research where they arise. And that led to the two great excavations that took place at Hungate, a five year, two and a half million pound archaeological project. And then the reconnaissance and excavation of 80 hectares of greenfield site out at Heslington East, the new campus three for the university. And of course, what we also went on to do was to promote public engagement in archeology. span We kick-started once again the whole concept of community archeology span in York. So, Poppleton Parish's archaeology project in the late 90s, um, taken on by the York Archaeological Forum and the chair of the York Archaeological Forum, the late John Hampshire, who I'm sure a lot of you in this room know. John was a huge supporter and enthusiast for community archaeology. And his enthusiasm and drive led to the creation of the post of community archaeologists that was hosted by York Archaeological Trust. <coughs> Where the council was taking, uh, was acting as developer, <coughs> then I managed to convince my colleagues that we should take a slightly different approach to that of the commercial developer. And so what we should do is where we are developing science, then we should give people the opportunity to take part in the excavations on those sites. 
We, as the council, you as the elected members, as an officer, as I was then, what we are is no more than stewards, representatives of the people. It is their archaeology. It belongs to all of us. So the best example of that was the work at the community stadium, where instead of getting a commercial unit in to do the work and deal with it and get finished within you know, two or three weeks, what we did was we appointed an archaeological unit, York Archaeological Trust, and they then engaged community groups, schools, individuals, and they were able to come on board and dig that site. That site was excavated by the people of York, guided by the professionals. So public projects, community stadium, these are, I think, how local authorities really ought to be looking at how they deal with archaeology on sites that they own, where they're the developer. And behind all of this, of course, in the 90s and early 2000s, we had that amazing, um, that amazing publicity machine for archaeology, which was Time Team. And Time Team came to York twice, 1999 and 2004. 1999, they brought their archaeology live um, program to York and over one fantastic August bank holiday weekend they took three sites, Roman sites outside the Royal York Hotel, now the principal, a Viking site in Walmgate. Normally to get to the Vikings you have to dig through five, six meters of deposits but in Walmgate we had a site where the medieval deposits had been evaluated so we had a trench that had gone through the medieval deposits to the top of the Viking deposits so they were able then to dig those Viking deposits. And we had a medieval site by Library Lawn. And we had, what? We had somewhere in the order of 50,000 people come into the city to see Time Team Live in progress. It was an incredible success. And it also engendered this huge sort of appetite for information. So the the, the evening press and the media were getting really excited in the run-up to that time team live. And they would ring me up on a regular basis and with all sorts of questions. One day they rang me up and said, um, who's going to be digging these sites? I said, well, you know, time team, they've got their own archaeologists, they bring their own archaeologists along, they're working with um, you know, local archaeological units, they'll be doing work. I said, well, will you be digging? I said, no, I won't be digging, I'm not, I won't get my hands dirty. And the evening press, next day, it's a story, it's a picture, John Oxley, principal archaeologist, will not get hands dirty. <laughs> Lesson what not to say to the press. So, in York, we not only have that example of community archaeology, we also have the examples of communities managing their heritage too. So we have the Poppleton Tithe Bar, St. Clement's Hall, Holgate Windmill, and perhaps closest to my heart, we have two examples on the city walls. Um, the Friends of York Walls, an amazing group um, who have taken over Fishgate, Poston Tower, and Red Tower, I know which some of you are heavily involved in, um, offering an inclusive, welcoming space for creative learning and social activities run by local people, encouraging local and wider community participation. These are positive examples of people managing the archaeology of this city. So, this place, this city, has this incredible history of public engagement with the past. And as usual, I've ranted on for far too long. Um, we have, in this world-class heritage city, an unrivaled record of researching, conserving, and interpreting this heritage. However, we've also managed, and we also empower people, people who want to get involved in research, telling the stories, and managing this amazing heritage. And we're here tonight to celebrate the achievements 
of one of the key organizations engaged in this process, the Association of Voluntary Guides, 70 years old. So congratulations, Chair. Congratulations to all of you individuals who every day go out there and tell the stories of this amazing city. And let's look forward to the next 70 years of you continuing to tell the stories of this amazing city. So, raise your glasses and toast yourselves to the Association of Voluntary Guides. Congratulations. Yay!